So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everybody. And we'll let Danae kind of do an opening statement and share some thoughts. And then we'll just kind of have a conversation. Uh, like I said, really, whatever will benefit you all. And some of it can be catching up. Some of it, you know, just seeing a little bit what Danae has been up to and, and career paths and experience at Yale. And we'll just kind of go from there. So we'll turn that over to you, Danae. Yat e she dene dormi nishe tabaha nishle na kai dene e vashishin totsoni dashiche na kai dene e dashanale. Hi everyone, my name is Dene Dormi. I am a citizen of the Navajo Nation. I am Yale College class of 2015, and I received my bachelor's degree in women's gender and sexuality studies. But I want to thank you all so much for being here today. Um, most of you are familiar faces and it's it like really warms my heart to see you, um, especially those of you that are sitting together right now. I think I didn't expect you guys to be like together and I'm like, oh, humans interacting <laughs> for Jay, Nolan and Madeline. Um, but many of you knew me during my time at Yale as an admissions officer. And for those of you who are new to the call, um, it's really lovely to see new faces as well um, or people maybe I haven't had as much interaction with. Uh, hopefully, hopefully we can connect. And if you have any questions afterwards, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm um, always more than happy to connect with uh, any Native students. So uh, like I said, I served as an admissions officer at Yale for three years after I graduated. So when I graduated in 2015, I uh, took a position as an assistant director of undergraduate admissions and also the director of Native American uh, recruitment and outreach. So most of my job was uh, traveling around, recruiting, talking to Native students and families about the Yale experience and um, really just trying to increase uh, the number of students uh, in our community and our representation on campus. So I did work in the uh, undergraduate admissions office while I was a student and an undergrad for three years. And that is the primary <laughs> reason I applied for a job afterwards. Um, however, I wouldn't actually say the admissions office was my primary job as an undergrad. I had, I worked three jobs while I was in college. So it was just one of them. And um, to be honest, I initially took it because it offered uh, really steady pay for me as an undergrad. And that was a, a definitely a priority of mine. Um, but also my dad had um, a little bit of history in college access. He used to run the uh, CU Boulder, University of Colorado at Boulder Upward Bound program for Native students back when he graduated college. So he had a little bit of experience um, just you know, working to travel and recruit Native students to that program and working alongside the University of Colorado admission office. And that, um, that experience that he shared with me really, I think, made me think deeper about my role in the admissions office and the fact that that could be something I pursued after graduation. So it kind of came out of nowhere. Uh, I think it made a lot of sense at the time. I have, I have since moved on from the admissions office and I now serve as the associate director of College Horizons, which many of you are familiar with. I know there's a lot of CH alums on this call and that also warms my heart. <laughs> um, I am a CH alumna, uh, 2009, I did the program and it was hosted by Yale. So uh, fingers crossed that one day College Horizons will return to Yale. And that's definitely something that, oh, and Diana, right, of course, Diana is a CH alum as well, <laughs> CH 2005, um, she put in the chat. So it's always really nice to connect with students who have participated in College Horizons. But even if you have not participated in College Horizons, it offers, uh, you know, a pathway and uh, opportunities for pretty much all Native students. So we also offer a program called Graduate Horizons. Uh, through our organization where students who are, you know, you're either you're a current college student, maybe you're a professional, maybe you're out working, uh, you may have the opportunity in the future to apply to our Graduate Horizons program, which helps students, uh, you know, apply and receive financial aid for graduate school in all disciplines. So we have different cohorts for that and that's a program that I spend a lot of time talking about as well. So definitely don't feel left out if you're not uh, somebody who has done CH because there's still opportunities. And then of course, 
um, we, we service students all across uh, the nation, but we, we actually focus a lot of service in New Mexico because um, something I didn't mention, so I'm from Albuquerque, New Mexico, and uh, I'm currently on the call from Albuquerque, which is in Tiwa territory, so we're surrounded by many Pueblo communities here and I'm grateful to be in this space. So College Horizons is located on Santa Ana Pueblo land, um, and that is also known as Bernalillo, New Mexico, a really small community just north of Albuquerque. And so our office is very small but mighty. We are five indigenous women. So we, uh, we do a lot of work with the local high school uh, that's down the road from our organization, and we have worked to implement a culturally responsive college and career curriculum uh, on that high school campus. So we go in and we do a lot of work with uh, the students at Bernalillo and one of our staff members, Christine Sweena, if you've attended our program, you may know her. Her daughter attends that high school and she attended that high school. So there's a really nice community tie there. So that's a lot of the work that I'm doing right now. It was a really natural transition, I think, from Yale admissions. Many of you probably met me when I served as an admission officer and a faculty at College Horizons, the summer program. So um, that's where I got to know a lot of you, and that's a place really the, of transformation for me. College Horizons was uh, kind of a, a mainstay program that brought together not just 200 Native students to help them apply to college, but also on the professional development side for me, it brought together about 70 to 80 admission counselors, and I know probably as high school students that may not have fully resonated, um, but for a lot of the admission counselors, we were also meeting for the first time or maybe using that space to network and connect with one another. When I was an admission officer, there weren't many native, one, native admission officers across the country, so College Horizons was a really special opportunity for me to connect with others uh, professionally, and I think that's something that has guided me uh, through my experiences. I still lean on many of the colleagues I met at that program. Um, I think there was less than 10 Native admission officers. I mean, don't quote me on the number, but it always felt like there was, you know, somewhere between like eight and t to 10 of us total, um, you know, that were involved with this program that had partnerships with over 70 colleges. So that was always intimidating to just know that uh, there weren't a lot of other people in the field that looked like me or identified as Indigenous. Uh, so that's something I think about a lot, and that is why I chose to make that transition eventually. I think that's kind of the basics of how I got to where I am right now, um, just in, in a quick, short form. <laughs> Thanks, Danae. Uh, yeah, so at this time, you know, we're, we're gonna kind of open up for questions. So if you wanna ask questions either in person or through chat, um, you know, feel free to do that and, and, and um, you know, I'll, I'll kind of get it started and then we kind of can go from there. Like I said, it's pretty casual. Um, but, but then if you could talk about, you know, the, um, you know, maybe a little bit about what it's like to work for a nonprofit and, and, and what that is or isn't. And sometimes, you know, there might be confusion of, um, you know, what that means and so. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's actually a question that I, I don't get too often, but it's, it's definitely different working for a nonprofit, especially having come from an institution. Um, so for me, like I said, admissions was something that I hadn't really considered seriously until my senior year. Um, so when I moved into that, that was my first job was in an institution. So obviously I was still working for Yale. Um, I think anytime you're a native student and you take a position with an institution, you're always going to raise your eyebrows a little bit. Like, is this really right for me? Especially after you have a four year experience where, um, maybe it was marked with some difficulty. Um, for me, it definitely was. So I think I was nervous about that. And, uh, you know, I have to say before I, before I talk a little bit about the nonprofit experience, I think to give some context and the ways that it's different from the institution is that I didn't expect um, to feel my transition from student to employee so harshly. Something I didn't consider was the fact that when you leave 
uh, an institution as a student, even if you're returning back to it as an employee, there are essentially no resources for you as an employee. <laughs> so that was a really harsh um, awakening. Like, of course, I had benefits, I had a job, you know, there, I was a part of a, a really wonderful office of people. But ultimately, at the end of the day, I was still just a, you know, 20, 22, 23 year old uh, recent college grad that was very used to the NACC as a space, very used to having different peers, advisors, organizations to be involved in, honestly, just support groups on campus. Um, my time at Yale was you know, largely within the NACC. And so I very much missed my friends, the student support, the peer support, also my college. There's just so many things and people that I, were, I was connected to there that that was a really jarring switch to understand that when I started working at Yale, there was only probably like three or four indigenous people on campus um, working there as professionals like total. And I don't know if that's increased at all since I left, but um, that was, you know, isolating because other people had affinity groups as employees at Yale. Um, so there was um, different groups you could be a part of, um, like the LGBTQ uh, IA infinity group or the women's group, but I just kind of felt like I didn't really have a space. I was the only indigenous person in the admissions office and that, um, that kind of lack of institutional support was honestly shocking after coming from a situation where I had been in the NACC. So that's something I didn't consider and something I don't talk about a lot. Um, so it was a really isolating job initially. And so I think when I jumped to a nonprofit, um, I was really excited because it was small, close knit, very family oriented. And that's definitely one of the pros of the environment I'm in at College Horizons is that when you're in a nonprofit setting, a lot of the time, um, it's really up to you to make your projects happen. There's a lot of self-driven work in a nonprofit. So um, I was used to, like I said, very structured, um, institutionalized stuff. Um, you know, there was a way of doing things in the admissions office, I think in a routine and a cycle that we abided by yearly. And the difference for me in the nonprofit world is that, you know, a lot of our work is driven by the grants that we're really trying to receive. So the money and um, that's not necessarily like a negative thing or I'm not saying that in a negative light, but you're constantly you know, trying to make sure that you do have funding for the projects that you want to run. So every year we're hosting these 200 plus native students on a college campus for a program. We're also hosting our transition program. We're also hosting Graduate Horizons. As a native organization, we wanna make it as affordable as we can. So that money kind of doesn't really fall out of thin air. We have to apply for grants uh, all throughout the year. We have to be tracking our progress. We have to be making sure we're keeping, um, keeping track of our data, honestly. One of our staff members is pretty solely uh, committed to the data process and the analyzing of, uh, of the data. And so I have a lot of respect for her. My colleague Amelia does a lot of that. And, um, and then I do a lot of the recruitment. So I think that I have a lot more responsibility on my shoulders in the nonprofit role, just because nonprofits um, in Indian country, they tend to be a little bit smaller but you can also find really big nonprofits to work for that might have staff, a staff that's you know, larger than 50 or closer to 100 or something like that. But in my case, it's just five people. So it really is driven by the five of us. So if one person isn't um, you know, pulling their weight, you can feel it on the other end of the nonprofit really easily. I think that's something that um, I had to get used to when I first started was just there's no one good, there was no one that was gonna tell me what I needed to do, maybe the way that the admissions cycle and deadline worked um, as an employee of a more, like I said, institutional space that was really structured. So um, yeah, and I think something to, too that I had to consider was that at College Horizons, my benefits were a lot different than they were for an institution like Yale. Um, I came, when I, was, when I was a kid and through my journey growing up, my parents were, very low income. And so I think in my case, I, my dad, my mom, they really valued me finding a job that would allow me to have good benefits. That was something that they were really worried about for me, I think. And um, honestly, I had, I had good benefits at Yale. Yale offers good benefits. <laughs> um, but I think for me, I realized that if I didn't feel like my values aligned ultimately with a job, or I didn't feel like it was the space I was going to grow into my best professional self, I needed to move on to a different environment with new challenges. And honestly, working alongside other indigenous women was something that was really attractive to me when I first thought about College Horizons. And I'm super grateful I made that jump. But I think in nonprofit 
in the nonprofit sector, benefits can just be really different. Um, every organization is different. So maybe you have to go out and find your own health insurance. Maybe you have to go out and um, figure out what it means, um, you know, to start a retirement plan and things like that. I am lucky that College Horizons has managed to accommodate most of those things uh, in my case, but like I said, it's a little bit different and it's all more case by case. It's a little more personal. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful my executive director, Carmen Lopez, who many of you know through College Horizons, is really uh, on top of everything and a very organized person. But I think in a lot of cases in nonprofit work, my schedule is really busy still. <laughs> I'm really, honestly, um, you have to hustle really hard to, to see the results of your work in a nonprofit setting because it's just less structure. You got to go for it. You've got to be on top of it. You've got to be good at time management and you've got to be willing to start your own projects and kind of get, get yourself going in that way. So, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, so does anybody else have any other questions that they might want to ask and by your i'll give a second pause but i have more and then um so let's do a fun one we did we did we did a more career one so what was your favorite place to eat here in, in new haven um that's a really hard question <laughs> i i kind of have different i have I have two experiences in New Haven in my head, my time as a student and my time as an employee. And I did different things in the two different parts of my experience. Um, let's see. Uh, well, I used to go to a, a really small Mexican restaurant. And I don't know if it's still there. Uh, it was called La Cocinita. And we used to order there all the time because it was closer to the Mexican food in New Mexico for me, like the red chili and just the kind of like ingredients they use. Um, so that was actually a, a favorite of mine in New Haven that is really random. <laughs> uh, and then on the East Coast, honestly, I miss Shake Shack, which is a little embarrassing. <laughs> but we just like, I really miss Shake Shack. I think about it all the time. Like, oh, <laughs> I miss that on campus. But, um, as a student, honestly, I just ate in the dining hall most of the time. I loved Styles. I was grateful that Styles was such a good dining hall. So that was my favorite place to eat. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad somebody in the chat felt that. Yeah, New Mexican food is very difficult to um, to find in uh, New Haven. I was lucky during my time that I think I was very homesick. My first year, second year, I can't remember, but um, uh, Steve Pitty, who's the, who was just now left, I think, his position as head of college in Ezra Stiles, was my academic advisor and is still um, a really close mentor of mine. He allowed us to put up uh, luminarias in the courtyard. Um, some people know them as farolitos, luminarias, depending on where you're from or <laughs> how you um, say it, but I was super excited about that. He's also roasted chili in the courtyard before, way back in the day. So he was a huge resource <laughs> for the New Mexico students, I think, during our time. And we would all get together in styles every holiday season and do something that was like distinctly from our region. So what projects have I done for College Horizons? Um, that's a good question. So. I work mostly on outreach and recruitment. So that is again, a little bit on the, along the lines of the work I did for the admission office. That's where my area of expertise um, is now, but wasn't necessarily something I knew about when I graduated college. Um, the only reason I started working for the admission office in undergrad is because I was one of the only native students that was involved in the NACC. So I think that position, like I said, felt really natural. It felt like we needed somebody that could talk to the prospective students. There was just literally nobody to talk to the prospective students when they visited for Bulldog Days. So I think that was something I was like, okay, this is a, this is a need. And um, then once I made it into that role, I started honestly learning more about students from different regions, um, different tribes, uh, different communities, and talking to more people. And I think that helped me move into the position for admissions. And then now in College Horizons, I've had all these experiences is traveling for Yale that have totally informed the projects I've taken on at College Horizons. Um, like I said, being involved in College Horizons as a Yale officer, but also doing large, I would say, um, 
trips through Oklahoma, South Dakota, Montana, New Mexico, Arizona, Wyoming. Um, you know, I, I went to as many places as I could that Yale hadn't historically been to. So I think when I took my position at College Horizons, my, my boss, Carmen, was really leaning on my uh, knowledge of these different areas and communities. And I, I kind of try to acknowledge that I'm an outsider in those communities, but just, you know, it's I think oftentimes better than a, than a non-native person or nobody visiting. And, um, and that's why I think it was important to find students that were involved in the center and wanted to, um, wanted to chat with uh, students too, on, on my behalf even, um, because I, I couldn't always fill in the gaps. I don't know what it's like to go to Yale from Oklahoma, right? Or from Washington or from New York. And so I think it was important for me to, to be in that mindset and, and remember that, but at College Horizons, a lot of my work this year during COVID is, is honestly up to me. I have to be creative in how I'm gonna recruit students to this program and talk to high schoolers, especially since we did face a lot of issues with our summer program um, around internet access. We did find ways to, to, to get to that and like make sure students had computers, make sure students had hotspots. It was a huge undertaking to make sure that the 200 kids we had signed up for the program could still access our program. And I do a lot of the tech support and a lot of the social media for College Horizons. So I think a uh, bulk of the COVID-19 kind of response work has fallen on me. Um, as the youngest person in the office, um, but also someone that was already previously doing social media for College Horizons. So that's definitely stressful. I'm trying to be creative with a webinar series that hopefully we can launch this fall um, with different panels. Uh, maybe perhaps we'll be reaching out to some of you at some point. Um, we're hoping to hear from students who are going through um, through this situation and what decisions they've made and how it's how it's changed their mindset about school. Um, and the learning process and environment. So, you know, most of my projects are around outreach and recruitment and figuring out how we can elevate College Horizons presence nationally um, and, and really get, make sure we have students from, I run kind of analytics on um, each state and, and how many students are represented from each state and each tribal community each year. And so I can see the gaps of where we're either not getting to or where we're not communicating with high school counselors, where we're not communicating with students. And uh, those are things I take into account. Thank you. Does anybody have any other questions that they'd like to ask? Oscar? Hi. Um, yeah, again, thank you for taking the time to talk to us tonight. It's nice to meet you for the first time. Um, so this is a bit of a tricky one. It's something I've been thinking a lot about recently as I'm considering um, whether to take a semester off in the spring. Um, and so I understand as well that I'm bringing quite a bit of privilege into this due to my upbringing and on white passing. Um, so I know it's not as easy an option for some, but um, there was quite a like internal debate for me when I was considering coming to college. Because um, while I completely agree that Indigenous representation is in, like, important in academics and should be, you know, um, praised and pushed for, I was thinking four years at an institution like Yale, at a Western institution, you know, largely preparing me for a job in a capitalist economy, is that going to benefit me more than spending quite, you know, 18 to 22, that's quite a key developmental stage in my life. Would I benefit more being at Yale or, you know, going home, living on the res? Um, touch with my grandparents and my elders around for like <laughs> a long time, but, um, you know, learning from them, learning more traditional ways of life and pushing for sort of indigenous governance. So um, while obviously the work you do is highly respected and I thank you for it and pushing native kids to go into colleges, do you think that maybe there's a trade off there that we're losing some of that um, connection and spirituality that we could be picking up at home? That's a great question, um, especially during COVID. Um, so actually College Horizons has a, a lot of philosophy. Our philosophy is really around connecting college community and culture. So our idea is that well, you know, we're not we're not pressuring students to go into a four year college, but it is part of the resources that we provide. So many of our students go to tribal colleges. Many of our students choose to go on to the military. So we track all of our students through the National Clearinghouse and, and track the different decisions that they choose to make. For us, we really see our jobs as um, connectors. That's a word we use a lot. And so we hope that we can be a, sort of a space for families, students, 
uh, college admission professionals, native communities on campus to connect to make sure that that is a right decision for the student. Um, I like to believe that you don't have to sacrifice that to go to college, but I, I'm also like very aware of what you do sacrifice when you go to college inherently. Like you're living in a different space, you're not able to be at home, you often don't have access to the lands that you need, um, you know, the language that you need, things like that. Um, I think for me, I was honestly just not very versed in any of this, um, you know, academically when I was an 18 year old in high school. So college was a very natural jump for me. I was like, obviously I need to be employed or I need to think this way. So um, I think I would probably still make the same decision. I think at College Horizons, we're really just trying to empower our students to sort of reach their potential through higher education. That is part of our philosophy. But the reason, I think the, the reason we think our program honestly stands out is because we encourage students to continue to carry um, who they are and not lose sight of that while they're sort of you know, taking this journey or taking this um, part of their journey maybe away from home. But for some students that is still at home. So it just depends. Um, I think a lot of people see a small sampling of our students that do end up in Ivy League institutions or in predominantly white institutions. But like I said, our students are honestly all over the country and it's, we handle it on a case by case basis, I think. So, um, you know, that's a trick. You're right, it is a tricky question. I think that depends on who you ask. Um, but I know that it's my job and sort of goal to empower the student to make that choice for themselves and give them all the information that they need in order to make that choice. Um, I'm definitely not someone that's going to preach at students that this four year degree is going to save you in any way or is going to even save your community in any way. Um, I think ultimately it's what the student de determines or what the person, um, you know, determines how they're going to serve their community. Like I said, I've spent um, I spent three years after college in the admissions office and it, it, it took me seven years to understand that I probably wasn't going to ultimately serve the community the way I wanted to in that position. And that's why I moved on. So, you know, that's just kind of the reality I think is that we make decisions and decide how we're going to help our communities in these different ways. So, you know, if admissions is how you want to help your community, if going to college is how you want to help your community, um, that's, it really is a personal decision and it's, and at College Horizons, we treat it as a family decision. So we often invite family members into those conversations. Um, having everything online this year has given us the unique opportunity to actually open up our sessions to families and parents, uh, as well as the students, because we, a part of our philosophy is, um, reciprocity. And so we, we like to work with families directly. Like we believe they're a part of the process as much as, as much as they can be, or as much as the student wants them to be. And we will often have those tough conversations with parents um, around financial aid, around enrollment, around traveling, uh, things like that for students. So something that I've done since I've been hired at College Horizons that's made our team a little bigger is we've been able to talk to students in the spring on the phone or one-on-one -on -one and, and provide them more um, mentorship around their college decision, which wasn't typically our arena. Um, it would be more providing resources around the application process, but I think the decision is um, just as important, right? So once you get those decisions in, what are you going to do, which is like what you just asked. Um, so, it, you know, it's personal, I think. And, um, and I think it's a great question because it's honestly what you asked is why I haven't um, applied to grad school. Like, I think that is really the honest reason that I, I have held off on grad school. I think most of my friends and peers have moved on. And I think at this point in my career, I'm seven, or not seven, I'm about five years out of college. Um, and it feels like at times like, oh, am I behind? Like, should I be doing this? And then when I really think about it, I'm like, why? I put myself through, um, honestly, a lot of hardship being at Yale. <laughs> it's a difficult place to get through, even though I liked some parts of it and I love my peers and things like that. Um, but I realized I want to be in a mentally strong place if I ever decide to apply to grad school again. And I want to make that decision, um, you know, in a way that is going to be, um, something that feels good and healthy for me. So for me, that's probably gonna mean easier access to home, um, a place where I can live um, with the, you know, with access to the outdoors, a little more present in my life than maybe I have a car in New Haven, things like that. So um, I think that 
question that you asked is, is one that I think about a lot and one that's driving my own decision to apply to grad school or not. Um, you know, I think I'm gaining a lot of experience in the field. So if there's any advice that comes out of the question you just asked from me, <laughs> it's that don't rush yourself and make sure you're making the decision for you. I think with college, sometimes it feels, it, it feels like you've got to go. You're like, okay, this is the natural step. And that's okay. A lot of us have been through that step. But I think once you approach post-college life, you can shape that. And I felt a lot of pressure to apply to grad school because there was a lot of people doing it when I went. And I think now I'm in a place where I'm like, okay, I know I'm capable of grad school. Like, that's great. But <laughs> I just really want to make sure that I'm doing something that makes me happy. I haven't rested in so long. <laughs> like when I left admissions, I was so tired. And I was like, wow, I have just been like hard driving for on behalf of an institution for seven years. So working in a space that is healing with five other Native women, um, you know, doing work that I was, I felt was honestly respected by my colleagues. Not that my admissions colleagues didn't respect my work. I was just tired of being the only indigenous person in a room um, for so long. So, you know, you got to do what makes you happy and healthy. And I think once I started living that and really saying like, I need to be in a place where I can run, where I can really have like real work-life balance, where I can walk my dogs every day, where I can see my mom and dad. Like, I'm totally not ashamed of that. Like, I need to see my family. We're a very close family unit. Um, I needed to be able to be close to my, my, my grandma, my relatives on the reservation. They're only two hours away here. I felt, I just felt like it was important for me to come back home um, to Albuquerque. So I certainly don't see that move um, as a failure by any means. I see it as honestly being the happiest I've been in probably like a decade. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That was so, so helpful. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that, Danae. That was really good. Uh, do we have any other questions? I know before the end, we, I, I know a lot of you know, Danae, we, we can go, I can stop the recording, go informal, and we can have a general talk. But also, I know there's a, a lot of, um, we have a few first years and some other students. So I think if we do one or two more questions for Danae, if there's any others. So today, I guess I was wondering, um, and, and it could, this could be the last one, unless somebody else has another one, is, is I guess, what do you know now? And you already kind of did this a little bit already, so it might already be redundant, but what do you know now that you wish you knew while in college? Um, a lot. <laughs> like, so much. Um, I think, well, I think most of you definitely knew me as more of like the bubbly admissions officer um, that talked to Native students and families. Uh, my time in college was definitely marked by a lot of instability in the center, a lot of transition. I saw the transition of, I mean, I guess if you include my Bulldog Days experience and recruitment process and all of that, about four different deans or directors. So um, it changed so much while I was there and I was also, halfway through my college experience, we got uh, the center. So, you know, I, I felt like I experienced like two different eras of the NACC and, and a major like turning point of it. And I think having gone through that, it was just, it was a lot. <laughs> um, so I honestly wish I had just told myself to enjoy my classes a little more. I think now that I'm like 28, I am always itching for learning opportunities. And if there is anything that will drive me back to grad school, it's the fact that I just simply love reading and I love history and I love bringing context to things and um, learning. I just love learning. And so um, that's something that I just didn't like do. <laughs> you know, I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot socially, but I did not have the uh, resources, but also even the maturity, I think, to prioritize school. Um, I think I spent a lot of time organizing for the NACC. Like I said, my freshman year, there was like four of three or four of us doing anything in the center. So, um, I think as a first year student, I mean, I ran for president of NA as a sophomore and I remember thinking like, this feels a little crazy. Um, and it's just cause no, like 
there wasn't a lot of people who were able to do things like that, I think at the time, um, who were wanting to put the center, you know, at the forefront of their life. I think what that ended up doing was actually burdening me with a lot of work. Um, and as a 18 or 19 year old, I was doing, um, I was doing the job of probably like a graduate assistant or like an assistant director. And it's not like I was being compensated for that. So I wish I had had the ability to really say no and protect my experience and my um, learning experience a little bit more uh, because I was really, really burnt out. And something that I was honestly really aware of was the fact that when I was there, I felt like the poster child of natives at Yale a little bit. And I consistently tried to like move away from that, but also recognize that not that many people were doing things. So there was always this like push and pull of what, what was I to the center and to Yale as a whole. So I just, I wish I had protected my like time and spirit a little bit better and just um, enjoyed my classes more. And I didn't prioritize my grades until my junior and senior year. And that definitely shows on my transcript. That being said, like, I really don't care about my transcript anymore because <laughs> I'm 28. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there's, you know, there's some not good grades on that transcript like that. Like it, it kind of makes me cringe to look at it a little bit from my, um, my first like two or three years. I didn't have a good semester until the spring of my junior year. And I think when that happened, um, I was a little bit in shock, honestly. I, I think I, I spent the better part of my Yale experience telling myself that I wasn't smart and that I didn't. Um, understand enough and and it was hard for me because I did go through an AP program I, I went to a, a a big inner city public high school um, so you know it was it was a, a low-income high school it was you know very diverse but we did have an AP program so I think for me coming into Yale I thought okay I can do this like um, but I was not ready for it <laughs> and and it still didn't it still just couldn't make up for what my peers at Yale were prepared for. I just, I just wasn't ready for that. And, and to top it off, um, you know, there was uh, even some Native students there during my time who had read a lot of Native texts in high school because they either went to um, a school in, where they had a lot of Native peers or maybe they had Native teachers. And I felt like I just like didn't even, wasn't even going to do well in like Ned's classes where we were reading Native texts that I thought I was going to be good at. Really, I was like relearning a lot of the history I had been taught. So um, I think that's a fairly common experience for Native students. I don't know um, how it is these days, but I think it was just, uh, it was difficult for me at a lot of times. And I wished that I had honestly called home more. I wish I had prioritized my grades more and I wish I had enjoyed my classes more and not burdened myself with so much work for the NACC. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, I just read Truman's question. So he asked what was important about the Yale Native community during my time and what advice do I have as far as nurturing the community? Um, yeah, I think, I think like I said, um, you know, nurturing yourself is nurturing the community. Like I think you, you have to make sure that you are healthy enough to be in that space. Um, just, I think, I think to be frank, the NACC had a lot of drama when I was there. And so um, bo both within like the transition of deans and like administration, but also within students and like um, the different organizations and things like that. And I just tried to learn about other people. That was really just like, I was like, okay, you know, at the end of the day, I want to make sure that I have friends when I leave college. Like I wanna make sure that I like, met people and like made friends and like did my best um, in this space. And you're just, you know, you may not see eye to eye with everyone and, um, and that's fine, but you need to take, really take care of yourself and make sure that you, um, you are not concerning yourself with other people too much and making sure that you have as, I think, as fulfilling an experience as you can in college as a native student. Um, these spaces can have been historically violent for people of color and native people and continue to be in a lot of ways. And I think um, it's okay to just like feel incredibly overwhelmed. Like 
the amount of Dean's excuses that I had had to like feel like I was like crawling to the desk to ask for or the amount of times I felt like I was just like honestly couldn't do it <laughs> were really overwhelming but I think that was the role of the Native community during my time is I, I hope there's still like all-nighters while people are studying and stuff because we used to just like procrastinate and sing a lot of power songs in the center and like watch a lot of dumb YouTube videos and sit together. And I think that time that I spent there was mostly what I remember from college because um, it got me through a lot of the really crappy days, I think. Um, and, uh, and I found a lot of balance through the community. So it was less so about the big formal structured events that we did. Um, <laughs> glad to see nothing's changed, Nolan. <laughs> um, it was it was less about that, and it was more it was more about um, like the moments that I spent with all the students. I think something I I really didn't believe um, people used to tell us like whether it was like Ned or somebody reminiscing about how you should like enjoy your college days. Like I feel kind of old like saying this, but you really should because <laughs> I think uh, that communication line, that open communication with all your peers, it really is not the same um, afterwards. And I still keep in touch with so many people, but it gets harder to like schedule FaceTimes and like see each other. And so I think, um, you know, and my heart goes out to you all right now in COVID because I think it's difficult to make those connections online um, right now already for you. So I don't know, maybe you'll have more practice hopefully. <laughs> um, but I think the NACC, despite me being a little burned out from it after four years was still my favorite space at Yale because, um, you know, I was one of the first people to walk into the center when it was built and uh, I literally like cried and it was really emotional because we had been on, we had been in the third floor um, of the Asian American Cultural Center and it was just one room and some like, some like old couches and a fridge and like a table and in a way I was actually kind of mourning that space like that was not the not the uh, most the sizable space <laughs> but it meant that we were always all in one room together and there was a certain kind of camaraderie that came from that small space as well and so for me as a sophomore when when we had to move out of that space it was I cried then too because it was really it was really hard after having my like formative two years freshman and sophomore year um in that space and realizing that like our kind of like cooped up movie nights all like 10 of us or whoever was there in this like tiny little like attic of a room um we're not going to be there anymore and when we first moved into the three-story house there was literally like still only 10 of us <laughs> so i think it felt really big at first like we were like man it feels kind of like sterile in here like there was nothing on the walls we were like it's huge it's like three stories there was nothing in the top floor, like nobody had had any drums yet, nobody had any art up, like it was so blank. And I just remember thinking like, whoa, this is like not necessarily better. I think obviously now by the end of my junior year, we had moved into it and made it a home and I felt so much better about, about it. And it, I really saw the significance of having a space on campus. And I think that's when um, our, our community flourished for sure, like after that, um, it, definitely in size and in involvement and things like that. And I, I felt like I definitely saw two different, um, two different, <laughs> two different uh, like eras of the center. So uh, yeah, not, I don't think a lot of people like there on campus anymore, like knew the third story, but um, they both had their like pros and cons, I guess. Uh, to, to the space and to the community. So I definitely, uh, definitely miss the center though, as a space to study, a space to sing. Um, I think the drum group marked a lot of my time at Yale. Um, and I was one of the only Palo dancers when I first got there. And so um, I, I had some experience singing, not a lot, but I had initially found it actually an arts group. And then that kind of just, we just kind of like morphed that into a drum group. and. Um, and that saw a lot of different like iterations, but I'm really grateful for that group because I think, I think singing together was like really, really important for me, like super healing during my experience at Yale. Um, like cannot stress that enough. So like, um, I'm definitely super happy for like those of you that have continued to find that as an outlet and as a space, cause that was really important to me. And, um, all the songs we like wrote together on the third floor and performed and, um, that was definitely my favorite part. <laughs> so, yeah.
Thank you, Danae, for, for joining us tonight. And, and thank you for the, the work that you do with College Horizons and, and helping all those Native youth get into college and understand that process, you know. And, um, you know, and when I was doing that work, I really enjoyed it too, right? Because it, it's an opportunity that those people out there who have the privilege, have resources, it, it's good that, that somebody like you and others are, are doing that for our Native students. And thank you for your, your time here at Yale and, and really helping build the NACC. And, um, it, it, and I know it means a lot to everybody. Yeah, and, um, and my uh, email is just Danae at collegehorizons.org. So that's also available on the College Horizons website. So if anyone um, is thinking about anything career-wise, even if it's later down the line or you have questions about admissions, um, recruitment, sometimes here and there, people, people um, in the NACC will write me for like advice on how to approach something with the admissions office or like, hey, what can I do in this area? So literally anything, you can you can DM me on Instagram, like whatever works for you. <laughs> um, and, uh, and also something I didn't get to like mention at all to you guys was like everything, um, all the like, the way that the nonprofit world and like College Horizons has shaped a lot of the advocacy I've been doing in running. So if anyone is a runner or has questions about running, um, definitely reach out to me because it's something that has carried me both through my time at Yale and in high school, but also now as an adult. And it's something I talk about a lot. So yeah. <laughs>